Okay. Do you want to start? Do you want me to introduce it? Well, you, 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 of course. You okay. All right. Well, welcome to the Introduction to Bioinformatics course. Uh, we aim to cover a lot of things. By the end of this course, you will be able to do your own bioinformatics analysis from start to finish, basically, at least the basic ones like uh, RNA seq, chip seq, any kind of sequencing alignment, uh, transferring files back and forth, do some basic Linux operations, work on the server, submit your own jobs onto the server. And it's not like, you know, bioinformatics was like something that I knew coming in. And as, you know, more of a bio on the biology side thing, you can then talk with the computational biologist or the bioinformatics or the statistician to help you understand the math and the math better. But they don't know, you know, they don't know the biology. So they don't, they don't even know what experiments you're doing half the time. And so when you send them data, you're like, oh, you know, please analyze this. They have no idea exactly what you want. I think that's, that is the majority of the problem that exists today between you know, things that occur on the biology side with things on the computational side. And if you can interface that a little bit more, that's when, you know, all of a sudden, you know, your projects start working. We'll just use the top 10 genes, which are the most significantly expressed genes. You see SSR clustered together. So everything's about the question you're asking. How is that different than, say, like, clustering with principal component analysis? It's not. It's actually principal component analysis. The bioconductor packages, the ones that we will require are uh, um, DC2, uh, gene filter. Why do I care about sequencing quality scores? And this is something that most of, most of you probably don't think about, but it's important. I'll, I'll show you a very big example of why that's important. So if you don't put one out there, it could be 1.2. It will be, no, it will be 1.0. Yeah. Just the fact that heat map would take these labels and put them down here. And in a, in a big big plot, you could never really tell, but you would look at the dendrogram and you say, well, where does it end? What sample does it end? And you kind of look down and you lose your way. And you, and when you, so it, that was wrong. So I put the, the labels right next to the dendrogram so you can tell. Um, another thing is it, it allowed you to have one but row. My question is, is, if you change the distribution, you yeah. don't know more and more. The central limit you hold, or no, or you don't, you don't know, right? So how? You so the central limit theorem tells you that the, if you estimate the mean of some population, even if it's not normal, the mean will have a normal distribution. Um, so to define significantly, we'll get to that in a second. So what you care about really is this this difference here, and we define what's called a test statistic. You say on n hundred is the sample. Exactly, exactly. You take 100 samples of group A and 100 samples of group B, and you measure the expression. What are the closest genes? What is the distance? You know, because if it turns out that it's a, a protein binds, say, 5 k, a 5 kb upstream. How many reads do you have per million of the total? So essentially, you're just scaling to make the totals the same across all, all samples. Uh, so now, if you do L apply X and function ELT where you define ELT of one as your return value. Okay, so I know, let's let's just go over this slowly. So, so it, that was wrong. At this point I can turn off the camera.